Welcome to Cambridge Orthopaedics. My name is Jay Rowell. I'm going to do my best to talk about bilateral femur fractures. And the reason why I'm talking about them is because they're a severe injury with bad outcomes. Okay, so but people and patients that sustain bilateral femur fractures are severely injured patients. And generally, you can't talk about bilateral femur fractures without talking about a patient that is multiply injured. The outcomes are affected by the abdominal injury, the head injury, the chest injury, there's an association with ARDS, acute lung injury, fat embolism, and propagation of a severe head injury. On occasion, you may find that the under-recognized head injury then becomes a severe head injury following a bilateral femur fracture. There's a mortality rate associated with them of between 10 to 20% in the literature. As the evolution of the management of the multiple injury patient has occurred over time, so has the management of long bone trauma. For a period, there was a phase of early total care, um, and that early total care was that every injury was dealt with systematically in a stepwise manner as the day went on for that injured patient. Unfortunately, there was a recognition following early total care that patients didn't do so good. There was an association with ARDS, sphere ARDS, and this was at the time where patients didn't do well. And there was a mortality associated with that severity of lung injury. Hence, the pendulum swung the other way and you had damage control orthopedics in terms of traction pins and external fixators being applied. Now we've come to a position of somewhere in the middle where we're evaluating, assessing the patient based on parameters of resuscitation and thereby judging how we should proceed. There's still the holy grail being sought after of the measurement of um, inflammatory response and significance of the injury, such as IL-6, IL-8 and other cytokine measures. There's been an understanding over time of the effects of trauma um, and outcome such as a terrible triad of death, where if you have a cold patient who is acidotic, their enzymes do not work well, and therefore the clotting cascade goes off, developing a coagulopathy. There's also a whole coagulopathy associated with trauma in its own right. That, in addition to the fact that they have a systemic inflammatory response syndrome, they also have an immunosuppressive syndrome and a persistent catabolic state over many months, if not even longer, after having major trauma. The wonderful thing over the last few years has been the development of tranexamic acid as a widely spread and utilized tool in the management of trauma patients. It has certainly saved lives. But our goal as surgeons, our goal is to avoid the second hit. And it's long been recognized, I mean, this is a paper going from 1989 by Bone et al, um, that actually when there was delayed surgery to isolated femoral shaft fracture, there was a worse outcome. And there was a worse outcome also when it was associated with multiply injured patients, as demonstrated in this paper, with fat emboli syndrome, higher rates of ARDS, and higher rates of intensive care units and hospital stay, and therefore a greater cost overall. When it comes to bilateral femur fractures, Bilateral femoral nailing is associated with a high rate of lung injury from fat emboli syndrome. Um, and that's been borne out in the literature multiple times. But an isolated femur fracture and a bilateral femoral fracture do not represent the same beast. The bilateral femoral fracture generally has a higher ISS, higher associated injuries. And when you combine that with head, chest and abdominal trauma, the mortality and morbidity rate goes much greater. What we've also seen is that the association with abdominal trauma particularly carries a significant morbidity and mortality rate, which is rather surprising. Over time, through the management of the multiple injured patient, authors such as Valier and Pape Giannoulis have been pivotal in the development of an algorithm and pathways for the management of these patients. Really, it all comes down to resuscitation and getting a good trend 
to a better resuscitated patient, i.e. the clotting is normalising or it's never been off, the lactate is trending towards normal as is the, as is the, the pH and other markers of acidosis. But really, when you've got your polytrauma patient, scenarios where you're applying the true form of damage control orthopedics in terms of the application of splints and external fixators tends to be in scenarios of extremis, such as right turn resus, or in scenarios where there's an emergency laparotomy or an emergency decompression of the cranial vault, and therefore the opportunity has arisen provide an external fixator to the femurs or a distal femoral traction pin etc to provide some sort of skeletal stability and to reduce their trauma burden. Often the patients though are stabilized a little bit better than that and often they are getting better resuscitated and adequately resuscitated with a lactate trend that improves and if you've got all those parameters as mentioned earlier improving one could look at early appropriate care but in the context of bilateral femur fractures, probably stage one side for a later date, i.e. perform an intramedullary nail on one side, maybe the more proximal uh, femoral neck or femoral shaft fracture, and then stage uh, the other side for an external fixator, and then transfer and then change that to an intramedullary nail at a later date. For me, my main concern about these is the underdiagnosed or underrecognized head injury. Um, and the effects of uh, IM reaming, reaming on intracranial pressures before it's actually monitored. Now, if you have a controlled setting where the patient is resuscitated, they are monitored throughout, they've maybe got intracranial pressure monitoring, there's no associated chest injury, abdominal injury or head injury, then one could proceed with caution with bilateral definitive fixation of the femurs by intramedullary nailing but I would say proceed with caution. Here's a case example about strategizing surgical priorities. This patient jumped, sustained a pelvic ring fracture, so it's an LC3, with a transverse acetabular fracture, a left proximal third femoral fracture, and a right distal third femoral fracture. My strategy when it comes to this patient, if he has no chest injury, no head injury, and no abdominal injury, is to proceed with early appropriate care once he's adequately resuscitated. And when those parameters are good to go, we're good to go. During the case over, there needs to be constant vigilance and awareness by means of formalized dialogue between the anesthetic team and the surgical team as to when things are not going well. Therefore, build in a bailout into your operation know where the exits are. So the strategy was external fixator to the right leg. If the patient's well enough, proceed on to a left intramedullary nail for the proximal third fracture. If the patient goes unwell, bail to an external fixator. If they're still doing okay, proceed on to a percutaneous fixation of the pelvis. If the patient is unwell, the pelvis could be dealt with over the next 48, 72 hours quite easily thereby building stop gaps and places to bail out. We've built in a safety net on our strategy for operating on this patient. So the external fixator goes on, the intramedullary nail goes down, and all throughout all this, the patient is doing very well. Therefore, we can proceed using percutaneous techniques on the pelvis and acetabulum, and at another date, come back to do an intramedullary nailing of the femur that had the external fixator on. Here's another example. This In this scenario, I aim to highlight to you what percutaneous and MIS techniques were able to achieve in the context of early appropriate care and adequate resuscitation. This patient has a pelvic ring injury, has an acetabular fracture similarly, also has a very significant and severe chest trauma, no abdominal trauma and no head injury. So on the operating table, 
we proceed with gentle surgery under lots of local anaesthetic, um, minimal incisions, minimal blood loss, strategizing to perform the femur first before addressing a pelvis if everything is okay to do so. Therefore, through a controlled and monitored stepwise process, we're able to complete his injuries management definitively. So really here, the key messages are ensure there's adequate resuscitation, ensure your parameters are good, and then you're in an advantageous position to proceed with early appropriate care. But when you do so, regular assessment through the case and reduce your surgical hit. Thank you very much for listening.